Hey, City Light, Pastor Eric coming to you. Welcome to our stream. Now, I know that's an unusual welcome for us, but it looks like this streaming thing may be our normal for the next uh, weeks to come. And so let me invite you. Would you make this part of your routine? Leave your Sunday mornings open to keep worshiping Jesus. Have some friends over, maybe just a couple, uh, and watch together. Let's continue to worship Jesus together as a family. Well, let me encourage you with some good news. The days are past when God dwelt only in a holy room behind a holy curtain in a holy building called a temple. Look at what 1 Corinthians 3.16 says. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? That means that the Spirit of God today dwells in and among His people. So the power of God, the work of God, the love of God is in you, wherever you are, whenever you're watching this. So you're more than just a spectator. Let me invite you, would you participate? Open your Bible, take some notes, sing along. We may not get to go to church together right now, but we can be the church together now and always. So let's pray and get this party started. Oh God, would you send your spirit to move among us, your people, wherever we are, whenever we're watching this, would Jesus get the glory now and always, we pray, amen. In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go in the questions your truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. tomorrow brings with each morning I'll rise and sing my God's love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore. Far before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. Far before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. Far before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. Yes, you will. Far before us, you're the brightest. Shining in the 
darkness I will follow you oh, My lighthouse My lighthouse I will trust the promise That you will carry me Safe to shore Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound. And drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still And all alone Oh, praise the name Of the Lord his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god then on the third at break of dawn the son of heaven We look forward to the day when we sing your praises endlessly, when we glorify your name, when we stand before your face, when all sickness has been wiped away, when all fear is gone. How we look forward to that day, Jesus, when we see you enthroned, when we see you in all of your glory, when we worship you face to face. But Lord, now here in this time, in the midst of the time that we're in and the fear that we have, we worship your name, Lord. We worship your name because you're holy and because you're worthy. 
and because we can run to you in all circumstances and we can praise your name in all circumstances and all times. Because you are always good, because you are always faithful. We praise you for that today, Lord. Say light. Let's read God's word together. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? 
how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who are with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. This is the word of God. Doug, come on up. All right, let's pray, and then you can preach. Let's go. All right, would you pray with us? Awesome God, I thank you for your word today. Uh, Holy Spirit, would you move through your word? Would you speak to hearts, encourage your people as you always have? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What's up, City Light? My name is Doug, and uh, I get to follow Jesus with all of you. You may be on the other side of that screen, hanging with a couple friends from City Group or chilling on your couch in your PJs, but we're following Jesus together. Through a really, really crazy week, we're still following Jesus. By serving our city and staying connected, we're following Jesus. Listen, the whole world might change, and our circumstances around us might constantly change, but Jesus remains the same. Amen? Amen. Well, let me start with a question. Have you ever read the like children's book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? My family loves those books, and it's kind of all about like one seemingly innocent act and how it can lead to all sorts of crazy things happening. Like if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. And if you give him the milk, then he's going to want a straw. And the next thing you know, he's in your living room drawing pictures, and he get, he's giving a moose a muffin and a cat a cupcake, and they're all doing a puppet show right there in your living room. So I hope you've learned your lessons, kids. Never give a mouse a cookie. Our family loves those books. We've chuckled through them many times. And they're actually a pretty good illustration for some of the main characters in our Bible passage today. They're called the Pharisees, these religious leaders who would build rules upon rules upon rules, all so that you, God forbid, will never give a mouse a cookie. Because if you start to give a mouse a cookie, one thing leads to the next that leads to the next. And before you know it, you're sinning and you're turning evil and you're stealing from your best friends and your family and you're going to, well, that's not exactly what happened. That's not exactly what it was, but it was like that. And in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus interacts with these religious leaders and he highlights the failures of of their religion. Jesus, in the best of ways, kind of blows up their religion. And you might be wondering, okay, what does that mean for me? Like, why should you tune in for the next few minutes and actually care about what Jesus says here? Well, I think at the end of the day, we all have some Pharisee inside of us. Whether you're the firstborn who like prides yourself on keeping all the others around you in line and following all the rules, or maybe you're like a rebel at heart and you throw the rules in the trash can where they belong. Wherever you are on that spectrum, we all have something inside of us that like wants to be good. We want to look good and be better at whatever it is we value. It's like that quote on the side of Lincoln's Pub in downtown Council Bluffs. We love that restaurant. It's actually Abraham Lincoln's quote. Whatever you are, be a good one. 
It's saying, you know, whatever you value, just do good at that, be better at that. But the good news is that Jesus didn't actually come to make us better. Jesus didn't come to make us more gooder, if you will. No, Jesus didn't come to deliver rules upon rules. Jesus came to give us life. So whatever you are, if you're worn out and exhausted, from trying to live up to your expectations. If you're weighed down by all the expectations and how you just wish everybody else would try harder, then Jesus' words are for us this morning. Let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It reads like this. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Now, pause right there. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing terrible going on here. In fact, in the Bible, way back in Deuteronomy, God actually wrote a rule. He had a law that said, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. It makes sense, right? If you're walking by, go ahead and grab a snack, but don't bring your combine and actually harvest all your neighbor's crops. And all our farmer friends said, amen. I hear you on the other side of the screen. Like, that's what the Bible said. That was God's original rule. But then these Pharisees, they came along, and they did their whole, like, give a mouse a cookie thing. And they started thinking, you know what? Well, if you're not supposed to harvest their grain, then you probably shouldn't walk by their grain. And if you shouldn't walk by their grain, then you definitely shouldn't touch their grain. You shouldn't even look at their grain, and you certainly shouldn't walk by or look at it or touch it on the Sabbath day, because that's like the super holy special day when all of our rules, they get bigger. They added rules upon rules to God's original rule. And now, here we have Jesus and his crew, like his disciples, on a Sabbath morning stroll, and they walk by some grain. They don't only look at the grain, they don't only touch the grain, but they actually eat some of the grain. It, Jesus just gave a mouse a cookie. And so these religious leaders are upset. They say in verse 2 to Jesus, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And by lawful, they mean their law. The laws that they made up, not God's original law. So Jesus says to them in verse 3, He said to them, Have you not read what is written? And then He goes on and He begins to dismantle their religion. First, he highlights how King David, this revered and respected king to these religious leaders. King David, one time, he went into uh, the temple and ate the bread of the presence, which was technically a no-no, but that was okay. He was in a desperate, needy situation. He didn't violate the heart of the law. Jesus goes on, he says, hey, religious leaders, even you guys, you work on the Sabbath. You offer sacrifices for everybody at the temple, and that's okay. You're not violating the heart of the law. Eventually, Jesus tells them in verse 7, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. In other words, if you actually had a clue why the law was given to you, then you wouldn't be throwing a fit at my disciples who are doing nothing wrong. If you had a shred of mercy in your bones, then you would set aside your religion police badge and maybe even enjoy a snack yourself. Do you want some? That's what Jesus is doing here, and it all adds up to this. This is where I think the rubber meets the road for you and for me. Religion, adding rules upon rules to God's original good rule. Religion misses the heart of God. Religion misses the heart of God. God didn't give us his law so that we would add a bunch of new laws 
to it. God didn't give these leaders his law so that they would turn into religious police. Here's my better Pharisee than you certificate. I got a gold star because I followed all the extra rules too. No, the law was given, the old school law, like Exodus, Leviticus, Ten Commandments sort of law. It was given so that Israel could know the heart of their God. But these Pharisees, when they would add rules upon rules to God's original rules, they missed the heart of God. Now, let's be honest. We're not Pharisees. No, we're we're living in 2020 in Council Bluffs, and we're just trying to, like, stay alive and healthy and keep working a job and figure out what to do now that the kids are home all the time. So like, what does this mean for us today? Well, have you ever tried to start like a habit of having a regular quiet time alone with God in the morning, right? You like wake up a little bit early. You're going to read your Bible and pray and just enjoy that time alone with God. That, that's awesome. But then what happens whenever you like miss a day or two or ten? Well, what can happen is religion kicks in, and you start to feel bad. And then religion keeps on kicking, and you start to feel like guilty or feel dirty. And does God really love me? Like, can I feel his love for me? Because I don't know, he might be mad at me for missing 10 days in a row. Religion can cloud our thinking and actually keep us from God's heart of love for us. Or have you ever tried to break a sinful habit? Maybe you're just trying to get rid of your anger problem or you're trying to stop yelling at your kids or stop cussing around your coworkers, you know, whatever it is. And you're working hard at it and it's going well for a few days, but ah, then you slip up, you mess up. What can happen then is religion can kick in. Here, here's what it might look like. Let's say we're trying really hard to not cuss around our coworkers, okay? And so we're like, okay, I'm not gonna cuss. And genuinely in our hearts, we want to show them Jesus. We want to love them well. And so we say, we're not gonna cuss. That goes well for a few days, but then all of a sudden we like mess up at work and we say a cuss word. And so we're like, okay, religion's gonna add rules to our original desire. And so we're like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wear a rubber band to work and I'm going to smack myself a few times if I even just think a cuss word in my head. So we wear our rubber band and we smack ourselves a few times and it's going well for a few days and then, ah, we slip up again. We say a cuss word. So we're like, okay, I got to do more than just the rubber band. I'm going to wear my rubber band and smack myself, but I'm also, I just need to avoid these coworkers more. I'm just going to bring a book and read that in the break room. So we're wearing our rubber band to work. We're reading our book in the break room. It's going well for a few days. And then, oh, we give the mouse a cookie again. We slip up and say a cuss word. So now we're like, okay, I'm going to wear my rubber band to work. I'm going to read my book in the break room. And then we start to tell our coworkers just how terrible of human beings they are because they keep saying cuss words. And we turn around to all our Christian friends and say, hey, if our coworkers wouldn't say so many cuss words, then everything at work would be better. And then I wouldn't have to wear a rubber band to work. And then I wouldn't have to read a book in the break room. And maybe I could get an A plus on my be a good Christian report card at work. That's religion. Did you notice it it like all started with a genuine heart to know God and make God known at work, but it ended up with a blame everybody else set of rules upon rules. We've all done this. And to be honest, like we've all missed the heart of God. We can do it in the checkout line when we go grocery shopping, right? And you look over and somebody's got a ton of toilet paper and you're like, well, they got a spirit of fear. You know what? They are not trusting God. They need to just get rid of their anxiety and start trusting God. Rules upon rules, we can miss the heart of God. We can do this with our kids. Oh my goodness, how could you possibly have behaved that way? You know what? You can't watch YouTube. Don't even get on the computer. Don't even go near the computer, and you better not even have a smile on your face. Rules upon rules, we can miss the heart of God. Religion takes us from receiving God's heart to missing God's heart. 
religion takes us from showing mercy to others to expecting sacrifice from others. So can I just ask you, where is religion keeping you from the heart of God? Maybe it's in your spiritual disciplines. Oh, I don't read my Bible enough or pray enough. Maybe it's in your financial giving. Oh man, I forgot to give last week. Does God still love me? Maybe it's in church community. Oh, we were sick and so we missed city group. I mean, is that okay? Is God going to get upset with me? Where is religion keeping you from the heart of God? The first problem with religion is that it misses the heart of God. The second problem with religion we see in the next part of our passage. Look at Matthew 12, verse 9. It says, Jesus went on from there, and he entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, these people, the religious leaders asked Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Okay, this was their question for Jesus. The sermon series that we're in, questions for Jesus. The religious leader's question is, hey, Jesus, can you do that? Really? Are you allowed to do that even on the Sabbath day? And these religious leaders are punks. They ask Jesus their question in the synagogue right there in front of this man with the withered hand. They don't talk to the man. They don't help the man. Instead, they ignore the man while they talk to Jesus. Jesus, is it lawful to heal this dude on the Sabbath? Jesus, can you really do that? Well, look at verse 11. Jesus said to them, which one of you who has a sheep If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. And all the religious leaders, they're thinking, oh, of course, I I would lift it out. I, I don't want it to get stuck there. I don't want it to get hurt there. I wouldn't want it to wither away there in the ditch. And Jesus continues in verse 12, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. In other words, you guys, you're caring more about a sheep than a man. Yes, I can do good on the Sabbath. Yes, I can heal him even on the Sabbath. And then Jesus does it. He heals the man with a withered hand. He like turns to him. He sees him. He cares about him. And then right then and there in front of the synagogue uh, rulers, in front of these religious leaders, Jesus heals the man with a withered hand. Here's the problem with religion that we see in this story. Religion misses people. In the first story, religion misses the heart of God. But in this story, religion misses people. The Pharisees' rules upon rules kept them from actually caring about this hurting man. They didn't even talk to the man. They just used him as a prop. They used him as a problem to solve. They just used him as an object. Religion misses people. And here's... Here's where I have to be honest, okay? Confession time. I am a Pharisee. Like, I'm a religious man. Not because I get paid to be a pastor, but because my heart is like a factory of religion. Just churning out more and more religion with my smokestacks blowing sky high. And really, for us religious people, the more we can admit that, The sooner we can admit that, the better. And I know in my life, this religion misses people. It's caused real hurt in those who are closest to me. Here's how it can show up in my marriage. I want to be a good husband. It's almost like my religion is being a good Christian husband. And and, and so I'll read books about being a good Christian husband. I'll abide by good Christian husband rules. Uh, A good Christian husband, he provides for his family. Check. A good Christian husband, he talks to his wife. Check. A good Christian husband, he prays with his kids before bedtime. Check. A good Christian husband, he, he takes his wife on dates, except maybe in a global pandemic, but you get the idea. Check. I, I try to be a good Christian husband. I don't really mean to, 
but my factory of religion, (laughs) my heart, keeps churning out these good Christian husband rules more and more and more until eventually I'm wrapped up in my own religion and distant from my wife. It's like all my attempts to actually be a good Christian husband ended up pushing me away from her. It's like my religion replaced my relationship with her. That's religion. And it's the same thing that we talked about earlier. You remember the person who wanted to stop cussing around their co-workers. You remember that all started with a like, genuine desire to love co-workers and show them the love of Jesus. But then as they built more and more rules, it ended up distancing them from their co-workers to where eventually they blamed it all on their co-workers and avoided them. Religion misses people. Religion can even hurt people. So what's the solution, right? Like, how do we change? What's the solution to resist religion? Whether you've been a Christian for five decades or for five days, you've probably felt this religion struggle. Religion exhausts us and we miss the heart of God. Religion wears us out and we begin to miss people. So how do we resist religion? What's the solution? I think Jesus gives us the solution in Matthew chapter 12, verse 8. As Jesus is rebuking these Pharisees for their goofy Sabbath day laws, he says something about himself. Look at verse 8. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, okay? Jesus says the Son of Man himself is Lord of the Sabbath. Here, Jesus is strategically and intentionally inserting himself back into the center over the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Pharisees had built rules upon rules upon rules to where eventually their rules were the Lord over Sabbath. Their rules ruled them. Their rules ruled everyone else. But here in verse 8, Jesus just blew up their rules. Have you ever watched one of those videos of like an old football stadium or office building being safely exploded. It's like an old concrete fortress where thousands of people used to go watch a game or they used to go there and do their work. And they'll make these videos where they get from a safe distance and they like explode, implode the building. And you can watch the concrete fortress fall. This is what Jesus just did with these Pharisees' religion. He blows up the concrete fortress of religion. And as all the rubble crashes down to the ground, and as all the dust settles, we find Jesus there in the center, standing strong, standing tall. Sorry, Eric. Standing brave. And he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So what's the solution to religion? It's the lordship of Jesus. How do we resist religion? By submitting to the lordship of Jesus. Notice that the solution isn't to like throw out all rules and just live however you feel like living. Just follow your heart and if it works for you, then go for it. The solution isn't anything goes, everything's okay, it's all about you living. No, the solution to religion is submitting to the lordship of Jesus. That means listening to Jesus, following Jesus, obeying Jesus. And maybe Jesus said it best himself in Matthew 11 verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
we yoke up with Jesus. He's the bigger, stronger ox, and we go into the other side of the yoke, and he leads us, directs us, guides us, steers us, commands us. We're yoked up with him, becoming more and more like him. His words become our life. His heartbeat sets our pulse. His passions become our purpose. When he says, go, we go. When he says, stay, we stay. It's the lordship of Jesus. If we're submitting to the lordship of Jesus and resisting these religious rules, then should we still have a quiet time alone with God? Sure, but we do it because we're yoked up with Jesus and we want to know his heart and connect with him, not just check a religious box. If we're submitting to the lordship of Jesus and resisting religious rules, then can I still be a good Christian husband? Yeah, but I do it because I'm yoked up with Jesus and his love inside me fuels my love for Whitney to know her and see her and delight in her. And if we're submitting to the lordship of Jesus and resisting religious rules, then should we stop cussing around our coworkers? Absolutely, but the power to change doesn't come from smacking ourselves with rubber bands or reading a book in the break room. The power to change comes from yoking up with Jesus, learning from him, his heart inside us beating through us. That gives us the power to change. And maybe the million-dollar question at the end of the day that matters most, if we're submitting to the lordship of Jesus and resisting religious rules, will we still mess up? Like, will we still sometimes give the mouse a cookie? Yeah, we will. But the good news is that the lordship of Jesus is radically different from the tyranny of religion. When we mess up, when we sin, when we fail and fall down, slip up and mess up, how does Jesus respond as our Lord? What is his lordship like? Well, I think Matthew answers that for us in chapter 12. When Jesus is your Lord, he will serve you. Verse 18, behold my servant whom I have chosen. Jesus is the servant of God, which means he's going to make a great Lord to you. He's a humble Lord. Verse 19, When Jesus is your Lord, he won't yell at you or fight you. Verse 19 says, He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. In other words, Jesus doesn't throw fits or threaten you to try to get you to change. He is a gentle Lord. Furthermore, when Jesus is your Lord, he won't kick you while you're down. Verse 20, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Even when religion left you bruised and without breath, Jesus isn't going to come along and kick you while you're down. He is a patient Lord. And finally, when Jesus is your Lord, he gives you hope. Verse 21, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Because Jesus went all the way for you and paid the price for you and even died on the cross for you. You can have hope as you're making changes in your life. You can have hope that you will actually be different. You can have hope not because you're coming up with more rules to keep the cookie away from the mouse, but you can have hope because your Lord, Master, Boss, Commander, King, Leader, He also died for you And when he died for you, he paid the ultimate price for all of your mess-ups and your slip-ups, your fall-downs and your failures, your mistakes, your sins, all of it, past, present, and future. Your Lord is the kind of Lord who dies for you. That's the Lordship of Jesus. So City Light, wherever you are, this morning, wherever you are hearing this message, can I encourage you? Let's resist religion and embrace the lordship of Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we pray even now that you would take these words of Scripture, how beautiful your Bible is and how alive it is, 
Oh God, would you take these words and breathe life into our hearts? For those of us who um, just default to religion, and we get worn out with all the rules we throw upon ourselves, we feel overburdened by guilt, would you give us the grace to see how good of a Lord Jesus is? That his lordship is kind and gracious and gentle and patient. May we run into the yoke and say, Jesus, I'm yoking up with you. You're better than all these rules, all these regulations and expectations. And Father, for those who would say, you know what? I'm not really the religious type. I don't care about rules. I throw them to the wind. Oh, would you show them how good Jesus is? And may they too run into the yoke and say, Jesus, I'm yoking up with you. You are better. Lead me, guide me, direct me, steer me, command me. I want your lordship to give me life. Jesus, draw us closer to you. Let us learn from you, even in these times, even this week, let us learn from you and find that you are gentle and lowly, that you are gracious and kind. We trust you in Jesus' good name. Amen.
Hey, thank you, Doug. Man, I, I loved uh, how you took a passage. I read a passage like this in Matthew, and sometimes I just struggle to find my place in it. I think, man, those Pharisees were terrible people, and I'm so much better than them. And you just did a good job of helping me realize, oh, I, I do the same kinds of things. Not, not because I want to be terrible to the people around me, but what starts as something good in my heart can turn into rules on top of rules that separate me from the people in my life. And so, man, you just helped me realize I am a Pharisee sometimes. And after that, pointed me to the love of Jesus. Like, what is the alternative to rule, being ruled by rules? It's living under the loving lordship of Jesus. And so thanks for just like opening the scripture in a way that helped me find a place in it. That was awesome. Uh, friends, I got a couple things for you before we wrap up here. Number one, if you're a guest with us, thank you for joining us. I know this is kind of a new way to experience church for the first time, logging in online and checking out a sermon. So thanks for doing that and giving us your time this morning. We're so glad uh, that you let us be part of um, your life. If you want to know more about City Light Church in Council Bluffs, what we believe, how to get connected, we have small groups that meet throughout the week called City Groups. If you want to learn how to join in with one of those, uh, we put some links in the description to this video. You can go ahead and click on um, the one that says get connected and it'll send you to our web page and that'll show you how you can find out more about all of those things. So thanks for jumping in with us and uh, we hope that you will connect further. Click that link. Number two, uh, our, our community is facing all kinds of challenges, new challenges in this season. One is there are a lot of kids that are going hungry in our schools. It's been so cool to see how our church and the churches in our city have rallied together. Um, even just to my right right now, there are tables that have been filled with groceries to send home to families in need. Um, hey, if you want to support what we're doing here, this is a time where the needs are higher than normal, and we would love to have your support as a church. It matters, um, and honestly, giving is a challenge in this season when the giving box isn't easily accessible on your way in or your way out. So again, we've got links in the description of the video. If you find the one that says give, uh, you can uh, go to our website. It'll take you to our website. There are two things that you'll find there. One is the address to our church. If you're the old-fashioned, fill out a check, put a stamp on an envelope, and mail it in, uh, we would love to have you do that. We'll take that check and get it deposited. Uh, you can mail it to the address um, on our website there. The other option is just a link that says give online. If you click that link, it'll take you to a simple form. You can give um, by a debit card, credit card, or your bank account right there online. You can set up recurring giving um, so that you don't forget. Either of those options are great ways to continue to support the mission of God in these seasons of high need. Um, finally, I want to ask, how can we pray for you? In this season, stress is high, anxiety is high, the unknown is higher than normal. And so James 5 tells us, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so what do we do when stress and anxiety and unknowns and suffering is higher than normal? We pray more than normal, okay? Uh, and we're a people of prayer. So hey, if you've got prayer requests, ways that we can join you, we want to pray for you, click on that link that says uh, prayer and uh, let us know how we can do that. We'll be in prayer for you. Um, City Life family, we love you guys. Let me send you with this good word. This week, let's be a people that reject religion and embrace the loving lordship of Jesus. He is the servant who died for you, and that's good news. See you next time.